Good morning, welcome. Uh, I'm David Sproul. I'm uh, really pleased to have the opportunity on behalf of all of us at Deloitte uh, to host uh, the launch of the 2014 uh, Social Progress Index. And I'm really pleased to welcome all of you in the room and, of course, all of you uh, viewing this online. I'm told we have over 60 countries participating. Uh, I'm, I'm sure there's many countries represented in the room, but online we have over 60 countries participating. So really, it's a great opportunity for us all to join in what I'm sure will be a really, really interesting uh, conversation. But let me make a special welcome to Michael Porter. Uh, needs little introduction, uh, but I think it's worth just reminding ourselves that uh, Professor Porter, obviously well known for his work at Harvard, well known for his leading authoritative work on, on the economy, on competitiveness, on economic development, and of course, as he will tell us later, has now applied some of those skills, rigor, discipline to looking at measuring social progress and how one aligns the economic uh, development of countries with those social needs. I'm also really pleased to introduce our fantastic panel here. Uh, firstly, nearest me, Michael Green, Executive Director, Social Progress Imperative. Uh, I was at a dinner last night where Michael uh, compared, and he introduced himself last night, so I'm going to steal his line as a recovering bureaucrat, uh, <laughs> having um, spent uh, much of his time in government. Uh, and I remember him saying that uh, from that time, you know, he recognised very clearly what government can do and what they can't do, and the need for government to work and collaborate with other sectors, both business and uh, the, um, the uh, third sector. Uh, next to Michael is uh, uh, Bia Perez. Bia is um, Chief Sustainab Sustainability Officer for Coca-Cola. Uh, she also spoke last night. I won't steal any of her lines because I'm sure she'll um, uh, share some of them with you. But Bia leads the sustainability initiative for Coca-Cola globally, really focusing on all of their needs. But I noticed some of the priorities were around well-being, you know, women in terms of social empowerment, uh, and uh, unsurprisingly water. Next to Beer is uh, Sally Osberg. Sally uh, has spent all of her career uh, working with entrepreneurial businesses and really leading and challenging social innovation. Now with um, Jeff Skoll, uh, Sally is uh, President and Chief Executive of the Skoll Foundation and working with uh, Jeff Skoll, the founder, uh, she now leads a team really identifying and challenging businesses at the forefront of social innovation. And last but not least, and to my Deloitte colleagues needing little introduction, uh, Steve Almond, uh, the chairman of the Deloitte Global Board and also one of our leading uh, partners in the UK. Uh, Steve, as well as chairing our board, is on a number of uh, other boards, including the WEF uh, Board on Anti-Corruption, and last night was announced as also joining the Social Progress Imperative Board. So, Steve, congratulations on that. Now, before we go on and before I introduce Michael uh, further... I'd just like now to share with you a very short video. As countries work to build a more prosperous future for their people, the question is, how do they accelerate this process in the right way? A sustainable and prosperous society needs thriving businesses. And for business to thrive, it needs to operate in a robust society. Deloitte believes business has the power and responsibility to create an impact in achieving both. But business cannot and should not do it alone. The challenges are far too great for any one sector. Private, public and civil sectors must collaborate to drive social progress. And so that's what we've done. Deloitte is now proudly working with Social Progress Imperative an organisation driving the global debate on how to really measure progress. Because limiting a country's measure of growth and competitiveness to just economic indicators creates an incomplete picture. So, in 2013, Social Progress Imperative teamed with leading experts across sectors to develop the Social Progress Index. This index provides a view of a country's social and environmental strengths and weaknesses on the issues that matter most. Designed to complement GDP, the index will help illustrate the whole picture. With this, investment decisions can be further focused, allowing businesses to better contribute to building a stronger society. So how does it work? 
through measuring the social progress of over 130 countries, which covers over 90% of the world's population. The index considers three key areas. Basic human needs, such as water and shelter. Foundations of well-being, such as health and sustainability. And opportunity, the ability people have to improve their lives, such as through inclusion and personal rights. Insights from this analysis and the actions they ignite have the power to shift thinking for the better. Countries will be able to drive sustainable and faster growth through increased collaborations, more effective policies, and focused funding. Deloitte, with social progress imperative, is using its core expertise and global reach to extend this impact. But we need your help to accelerate the process. How can you be part of the solution? Now, as, as we launch the 2014 uh, index and hear more about that, it's perhaps worth reflecting that here in London, it's just 125 years since the publication of Charles Booth's seminal work on life and labour of the population of London back in Victorian times. And given that that was an investigation of the social conditions of Londoners in Victorian times, it was just an interesting perspective on how things uh, have progressed. Booth was a um, uh, successful businessman who believed that social reformers overstated the level of poverty in London by claiming that 25% of Londoners uh, lived in uh, conditions of poverty. But his study proved that in reality, perhaps unsurprisingly, the position was worse. Booth studied many of the things that were relevant in Victorian times that perhaps uh, we've now moved on uh, in current times. He looked at working conditions, education, uh, wages, religion, workhouses, police as, as the impact on social conditions. He lived with working families for weeks on end to try and get a better understanding and perhaps demonstrating that balance uh, that he applied, he wrote, uh, many poor children are very happy, free from the swarms of servants, nurses and governesses that overshadow the lives of more wealthy uh, families. <laughs> but he did also note, of course, and recognised that disease, hunger and even death were ever-present uh, dangers uh, in Victorian London. And of course, 125 years later, with the benefit of technology, enhanced data access, enhanced uh, analytics, we now have new measures of social progress uh, that can be applied on an international scale, and perhaps even giving a nod back to Booth 125 years ago. Now, I'm really excited that uh, we have an opportunity, as the video said, to uh, be part of that together of that important discussion and that we're bringing together the three important parts of society, governmental organisations, business and non-profits because we do believe we're at a turning point on two very important factors. The first is that the complexity of some of these social problems really do require cooperation, collaboration between government, business and not-for-profits. As Michael has said last night, and I repeated in my, my comments, recognises that government cannot do this alone. I think we all recognise that no single sector can solve these complex problems alone. So that need for collaboration is key. And the second thing, of course, is that GDP alone, perhaps, is not the only measure uh, that matters, as Michael will uh, cover. As Bobby Kennedy famously said, you know, GDP means everything except what makes life worthwhile. So, 80 years on from that comment, we do now have a chance to look at a more forward-thinking, more enlightened way of looking at development. And with that, with no further ado, I'm really delighted to welcome Michael Porter to the stage. Michael, it's all yours. Thank you. Well, David, thank you very, very much for... Uh, Many, many things, but uh, first of all, for that kind introduction, and, uh, uh, and Deloitte has been, right from the start, a 
core, uh, core partner and collaborator in this venture. Uh, what we're going to talk about today is, is something that was crazy, just a crazy idea uh, that's impossible. Um, and um, I think hopefully you'll see has really never been done before. Um, that involves massive amounts of data from massive numbers of countries around the world. And, you know, frankly, would we have been able to do this without the help of Deloitte and, and the kind of rigor and analytics and reach uh, of Deloitte? And the answer is probably not. Um, we couldn't have done it without Sally Osberg and the Skoll Foundation that has pioneered so many things in the field of social change, and, and this is one, another one of them. We couldn't have done it without... Uh, some of our uh, core companies, in addition to De- Deloitte, that really understand that we're at, a, we're at a moment, we have to change the game here. We have to change the discussion. We have to change the understanding uh, of, of how to look at development and how to, how to look at progress. Because right now we're getting more and more stuck. And, uh, and, and, and be from Coca-Cola and, and Cisco, another one of our partners that's helping to support this uh, event, uh, and others have, have been involved. We've, we've started to build partnerships uh, all across the world, and you'll hear from a number of our partners today uh, in terms of how this is actually playing itself out on the ground. But I, I am I'm so excited and grateful to be here, particularly, David, in this room uh, 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 under your sponsorship uh, because of the enormous impact that Deloitte has had on this entire effort. Um, what I'd like to talk about today is this uh, 2014 Social Progress Index. Um, we started uh, last year with a beta test of this, uh, of this work. Um, it, w- it was so complicated and so challenging that we felt we had to do a dry run before we were ready to call it uh, ready for prime time. Um, and based on that dry run last year, which was uh, introduced almost exactly at this time uh, at the Skoll Forum in Oxford, uh, we have spent a year uh, just getting massive amounts of feedback um, and, uh, and, and, and consulting with the best thinkers uh, on, on social change around the world. And, and what we're going to introduce today is this new index, the, the brand new 2014 index which has been improved uh, substantially from what we offered last year, although we were pretty happy with what we offered last year. Um, and, um, and, uh, and it's been expanded. Uh, this year, as you'll see, we have been able to provide uh, rigorous uh, assessment of 132 countries. We are, we are now covering most of the world. We aren't covering all of the world. We can talk about that later. Um, uh, and uh, I, think, I think what you'll find is that we have here the beginnings of something that could change the game in social development. Um, this, I think, offers the opportunity to be a crucial piece of infrastructure for driving social change. It's first and foremost about measurement. What we've learned over and over again is that if we can't measure and benchmark, it's very hard to improve things. It's very hard to be strategic. Uh, every issue is equal if you're not measuring. Everybody's pet project is equally relevant if you're not measuring. Uh, this is fundamentally about measuring, but it's also, as you'll see uh, over the course of this session, it's also about driving change at the grassroots local level. Um, And we are, first and foremost, our goal is to invite your participation in this effort. We're all in this together. Wherever we live, whatever society we're part of, whatever part, whether we're in business or government or the social sector, we're all in this together. This is about improving societies, it's about improving the well-being of people. And what we're going to talk about today is hopefully a critical piece of infrastructure that's going to enable us to do that better. But in order to do it across those 132 countries and more, uh, we're going to need uh, lots of us to kind of get behind the oar and pull. Whether it's getting the word out about the data, whether it's connecting with the business community, uh, there's a moment here for the business community to redefine its role in society. And that's what we're talking about uh, doing with this effort. Uh, And and there's a moment here to change this destructive and awful debate that's going on between the market 
and society, as if somehow those are at odds with each other, which is happening all over the world. Uh, There's an opportunity here uh, to avoid uh, Arab Springs in the future, where we have countries that are economically prosperous, but people are rioting because their conditions are so bad. Uh, uh, that's the stakes here, that's the opportunity, that's what we're trying to achieve with this effort. Uh, And so what I'd like to do today is give you the kind of uh, intellectual foundation of this effort, why it's so necessary, how it builds on past work. Um, Then I'd like to show you the actual uh, index itself and how it's been constructed, Um, uh, show you some of the results um, and the power of this data, Uh, And then, hopefully over the course of the morning and the panel, we'll start to see it come to life in reality, in the real world, in individual countries. Uh, And I think you'll find some of the stories of what's actually happening in individual countries, even though we're really just starting, uh, really exhilarating. And again, the goal here is to get you to participate. Those of you sitting in this room to participate, and many of you are because you're part of Deloitte or you're part of one of our partner organizations, Uh, but some of you aren't yet. And I can tell you there is a big job for you in taking what we're going to talk about here and actually making something happen uh, on the ground. And then all the people that are watching from around the world, uh, uh, we want you to participate. And in all of those 60 countries, there is social progress needed (laughs) There is change needed. There are things that must get better. Uh, And the hope is that you can be part of doing that, of making things better. That's what this effort is all about. So um, in order to kind of give you some uh, foundations here uh, of this effort, I think we need to, really the starting point of this is that as as time has progressed and time has passed, I think what we've learned is that we have we really don't understand development. We thought we understood development. But what we've had historically is an incomplete view of development. What is development? What does that mean? Uh, As we thought about development, we've been really focused mostly on economic development. And then we've understood that there's lots of social problems and those are sort of dealt with on the side. but we've not understood really the connection between economic development and actually societies getting better. We kind of assume that if incomes went up, societies would get better, and they do. You'll see that. But it's a very incomplete connection. Uh, And we we don't understand how uh, ultimately uh, that connection uh, is best uh, developed and managed. We've had an incomplete view of development. We've had an incomplete understanding of the connection between economic and social development. We've not understood the social dimensions of development in any rigorous way. We're all aware there's lots of problems, but we've looked at those problems in a siloed way. One group worries about water. Another group worries about uh, environment. Another group worries about uh, you know, women's rights. There's all these disparate efforts. We've never had a way of kind of looking holistically at development in the same way that we've come to learn, and I've been part of this in my own work, uh, economic development. Um, to, do, uh, to, do, uh, to take this holistic view of development, though, ultimately um, we are going to have to take measurement uh, and our framework for development to a new level. And that's what this uh, effort uh, tries to do. Now, of course, over the last uh, several decades, we've actually gotten a lot better at measuring economic development uh, and what really drives GDP per capita, uh, which is the kind of overarching measure of uh, success, um, uh, certainly economic success at at the country level. Uh, We've gotten much better at measuring GDP per capita. We've been gotten much better at measuring the, the drivers of GDP per capita and, and the determinants of competitiveness. Uh, and that effort, uh, because I've participated in it, I can tell you firsthand that effort to improve that measurement of economic development has allowed us to accelerate economic development in, in many respects in many parts of the world. There's been unthinkable improvements in competitiveness in many, many countries over the last 10 or 20 years. Uh, uh, The rate of change has been extremely high. 
Now, what we've assumed historically as we've measured economic development is that if we can get economic development to improve, that then leads to social progress. That's kind of the assumed relationship. Um, and um, uh, that's true. Uh, as you'll see in the data, uh, as GDP per capita goes up, uh, in general, social progress moves up too. Because it, you know, the GDP uh, and uh, higher incomes give you the capacity to uh, deal with more social problems, the resources necessary to have better education and, and, and so forth and so on. So there is a positive connection. But what we're learning is it's actually not automatic or one-to-one -one or even a tight connection. Uh, there's, there's kind of this uh, un, uh, uh, cl lack of clarity on how these things actually, actually connect uh, that we're starting to uh, understand. But we've not had a way to really understand that. Again, if, if you go back to the Arab Spring, what was going on there? You look at the GDP measures, they look good. You look at the competitiveness improvement in those economies, it looked good. Why would people go out on the streets and take over, take, retake the country from the authorities? You know, there's, there's a gap there. Something we weren't measuring, something we weren't understanding. We thought we were succeeding, we were not. You know, why are people protesting in Brazil? <laughs> They've been protesting for years now, for the last two or three years. Brazil's been a success. It's a brick, you know, it's winning. It's the wonderful emerging economy, but yet people are out there protesting. Middle class people are out there protesting. We don't, we haven't been able to capture and understand the connections uh, that are underpinning the, the fact that economic progress is not leading uh, to social uh, 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 progress. And, and this effort is an effort to really get at that. What we're starting to understand is, yes, economic development is a driver uh, and an enabler potentially of social progress, but uh, we're also starting to get the insight that it's actually making certain kinds of social progress that is going to enable actually sustained and successful economic development. Uh, but we've never been able to do this before. We've never had the ability to measure social progress uh, so that we can understand the connections between social progress uh, and uh, economic uh, development. And that's what this effort is ultimately trying to do. Uh, now, uh, there's been a growing recognition for some time now that we have to move beyond GDP. GDP uh, has become a sort of the whipping boy uh, and you know GDP is too narrow, GDP is too narrow. I think a lot of us understand that and we've understood that for a long time. Um, you, you know if you go actually go back who invented GDP? A guy named Simon Kuznets, an economist, invented GDP and in the day that he introduced GDP he said this is an incomplete measure. Don't just use this. That's what he said. But ultimately what happened is we, you know, it was a very convenient measure. We got better and better and better at measuring it, and, and it, it started, it started to, to drown out. Uh, and I think even Kuznets understood that that was an incomplete measure. Uh, and increasingly many scholars and, 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 and thought leaders around the world have understood this. And there's been a growing number of efforts to move beyond GDP. They've tended to take one of two forms. Um, one is to add social factors to economic development to try to understand progress in, 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 in societies. Um, the granddaddy of all of these efforts is the Human Development Index. Uh, I hope you know, many of you are familiar with the HDI. Uh, it is, was an enormous step forward uh, you know, tw more than 20 years ago. Uh, Amartya Sen and, and uh, colleagues uh, are really you know, amazing uh, pioneers to introduce that. Um, and what that did was it said, okay, let's, we can't just look at GDP, let's add some health and education indicators to GDP, uh, and then we'll end up with a composite index that measures both, okay? And there's been a whole string of additional efforts to add social variables to economic variables in order to better and more holistically capture development. 
Uh, there's also been lots of efforts, mostly futile, to actually adjust the way we measure GDP by putting in social capital and things like that, uh, which is incredibly hard and, and, in my personal opinion, never happen. Okay? Uh, GDP is what it is. It, it's measuring economic success. Uh, we, can't, we shouldn't try to modify that. We need, we need to actually measure what it doesn't measure. Uh, and that's what this effort is trying to do. But the traditional path has been to add economic and, G- and GDP, uh, economic and social measures together and give us a more holistic view. Uh, the other effort, as, as uh, you see here, is uh, to kind of jump to ultimately the ultimate purpose of development, uh, which is wealth, well-being and life satisfaction. And so there's this whole happiness thrust that has emerged over the last you know, five to ten years, uh, uh, and uh, there's, uh, uh, there's now systematic uh, measurement of well-being or, or life satisfaction across many, many countries, and lots of people have been focused on that as the way to go beyond GDP. Uh, now, we uh, applaud uh, these efforts uh, that have developed over the last uh, uh, decades. Uh, they are pioneering efforts. We've learned a lot. They have important insight and important truth, and they've taught us a lot. We are, we're building on those efforts. But we believe that neither the well-being approach or the happiness approach or the approach of adding social factors to economic factors and putting them together, we think we, think we can take this, this measurement challenge to the next level. Um, and so let, let me tell you about how we have uh, constructed our measurement framework uh, and, and the social progress index. There's, there's a number of key principles that we believe are necessary if we're going to truly unlock the power of this holistic view of measurement. Number one is we have to separate the economic measures from the social measures. If we put them together, then we don't know what's causing what. We don't know the connection between one and the other. Uh, You know, when the Human Development Index has GDP in it, what is it telling us? Uh, GDP is having a huge impact on whether that index is high or low. Uh, If we separate economic and social measurement, though, then we can start to understand how do these go together, in what ways do they reinforce each other, in which ways do they work against each other. So this index is fundamentally about measuring social progress directly and independently of economic measures, and then looking at the connection between the two. That, that's principle number one. You know, principle number two is this effort is based on as much as we possibly can measuring social outcomes, things that matter to a healthy society, not the inputs. We're not measuring how much government is spending. We're not measuring whether there's any particular policy that has been chosen we will get there over time, but uh, what we are measuring is the outcomes, the results. You know, are women included in society? Uh, is there the availability of safe drinking water? Water, not how much we spent on it, not how much we care about it, uh, not, uh, but 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 the outcomes. Uh, a lot of existing measures focused on inputs. You know, how much government spends, and says, well, if government spends a lot, then that's good. Uh, and a lot of efforts commingle the inputs and the outputs, and that gets you, again, very confused about what you're seeing uh, and what it's telling you. So this is another really key uh, principle. Uh, the third principle has to do with uh, actionability. Uh, although this is a measurement framework at, at its core, it's fundamentally meant to create the opportunity for change on the ground and to be actionable It has to be granular. It has to get down to the level of things that you can imagine actually doing something about. So although we have the Social Progress Index, which is a number, the real power of this framework is the ability to drill down to a very granular level. And in order to do that, we have to have a very holistic view of social progress. This is a complicated idea. What's social progress? It has a lot of dimensions. Now, there's been a vast literature, and many scholars have spent decades and decades looking and thinking about this. We're able to draw on all that literature, but ultimately, we never tied it together. 
we never had a holistic way of looking at social progress that encompasses multiple dimensions. This has been a very siloed uh, part of human endeavor where each, each issue is seen as sort of independently rather than uh, as a uh, whole. Um, and uh, well, I'll show you uh, some of the power that you get from looking at it holistically in a minute. And then the final principle is we uh, believe here that we're not focused just on poor countries. A lot of the efforts to measure social change are focused on the poorest countries. The Millennium Development Goals, for example, are focused on the poor, poorest countries. They're great, and there's quite an overlap between the Millennium Development Goals and many of the things you'll see that we measure, although we, we go much further. Um, but we want a framework, a broad framework for social progress that, is a, that allows you to look at the whole spectrum of development, the whole trajectory of development. And what we're, what we're going to see is that even very wealthy countries have social problems and social deficits. And we want to be able to identify those a, as well. And uh, what we'll see in the data is that uh, when, you get, when you get wealthy, actually you have some headwinds in social progress that you have to overcome. And, uh, and we'll, we'll talk about those headwinds uh, a little bit later. It doesn't just get easier and easier. It actually starts getting harder and harder in, in some respects uh, uh, in the end. So if we're going to measure social progress holistically, we've got to define what we mean. And it's interesting that you know it's the year 2014, and there was no definition of social progress. It just didn't exist. We've never kind of thought of this as, as sort of a, a topic that we can think of ho- holistically. Okay? A- and so based on the, our best efforts over m- many years now, or, uh, w- and based on the literature and so forth, this is the definition of social progress that we uh, have adopted. Uh, and I'm sure it will evolve and improve over the time, but uh, after massive commentary, uh, this, is, this is what it is. So social progress is the capacity of a society, first to meet the most basic human needs of its citizens. Shelter, clean water, nutrition, things like that. Okay? I think that's pretty intuitive. Uh, there's a long uh, well, tradition of, of work and awareness about, about that need. Uh, but in addition to that, establish building blocks that allow citizens to em- enhance and sustain the quality of their lives. Now, of course, we're going to have to talk about what that means. That's number two. And then three, the third pillar is uh, create the conditions for every individual, all individuals, to actually achieve their full potential, whoever they are, at w- with whatever, in whatever way they want. And that's what we uh, will, as you'll see later, we'll call opportunity. Um, now, uh, this definition... Uh, then uh, in order to implement this definition, we need then a holistic framework to put the flesh onto these intellectual bones. And this is the Social Progress Index Framework. You saw it quickly flash in the video uh, a minute ago. Three key dimensions of social progress, uh, basic human needs. You'll see the comp- what we call components of that. Uh, foundations of well-being are those building blocks. Uh, access to knowledge. Can, can you get access to knowledge? Can you get information? Are, are you able to find information, be, be, have access to the information? Can, can you communicate uh, can, do, can, with others? Uh, uh, you know, and, and you can see some of the others. Uh, and the environment, uh, and having a sustainable uh, environment around you is, 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 is critical, a critical building block if you're going to have a, you know, a, a, a healthy and prosperous society. Uh, and then finally, opportunity. You see the dimensions of opportunity. Do, do you have the rights to do things yourself? If you don't have the rights, you're not going to achieve your full potential. Uh, you know, is there freedom of choice? Do you get to choose as an individual? You know, or are you included? Uh, all groups in the society, uh, and, uh, and, and do you have access to that higher education that allows people often to uh, actually uh, rise to their, their full potential? So, uh, again, um, these areas are not, we didn't make them up. There's a vast literature 
uh, about all of these areas. Uh, traditionally, that literature has been siloed. We've looked, th- this group has looked at that. This group has looked at that. What we try to do is bring that literature together, uh, get critique from the, the best scholars on development that we can find, and, and build, uh, build out this definition and, and build out this uh, framework. And then, of course, the next level of the framework is to populate our key ideas, our key components of uh, social progress with specific outcome measures. And you see here uh, the, I I think it's 54 uh, specific indicators that ultimately go into each of these components and then ultimately get rolled up into the overall factor. Now, is this measuring everything that's important? No. There are other things that we know uh, could be on this list and should be on this list. What we are measuring, however, is everything that is legitimate, that has a scholarly foundation, that is rigorously uh, demonstrated to be important, where we can get robust, uh, objective international data. Okay, uh, And the data is the constraint in uh, expanding this even further. Uh, and we, in our report, you will see we list the six or seven or eight areas where we're the most hungry for data. And one of the things that we have to do over the next year or two or three or four is actually to cause that data to exist. When Simon Kuznets introduced GDP per capita, the way it was constructed was very rough. And then over the years, we got better and better at measuring it. And the methodology now to measure GDP per capita is really, really good. It's not perfect, but it's really, really good. We need the same trajectory in terms of the data to measure social progress so that we can capture a few more dimensions. Uh, Mobility, for example, is one that we'd love to capture. But there's no measure of mobility, of whether people can get around and whether they're free to get around as opposed to trapped in their village, you know, with no way to get anywhere else. Um, and, but there's no measure. So, so again, we, we think we've measured a lot. We're very, very proud that we've been able to create this rich framework, but we have a ways to go, uh, and I want to acknowledge that. And one of the ways you, both physical you and digital yous, watching this session can help us is to make sure that countries are measuring this stuff. For example, we don't have Singapore in this, in this list this year because Singapore is not measuring some of the really critical things that are even on this list. And Singapore prides itself on being very professional and measuring stuff. So we're going to go to Singapore. We're going to knock on the door. Guess what? You want to have a better society? You're not measuring critical dimensions of that society. And so get with it. Uh, so part of the effort here is data. Part of this effort is to raise the bar, uh, improve the measurement, and, and that is a, a critical uh, goal uh, of this project. Now, here is, in very small print, the 2014 first Social Progress Index ranking. 132 countries. That's why the print is small. Okay. Uh, the shading here is the, what we call the tiers. Um, each color grouping is a, is a grouping of countries that are kind of clumped. So there's kind of a top 10, um, and then it drops off. And then there's a next group, which we call tier 2, starting with Austria and going to the Czech Republic, based on the Social Progress Index score which is kind of a measure of the height, the, the, how, how strong or how extensive your social progress is. Then there's another tier from Slovakia to uh, Israel, another tier from Kuwait to all the way down to Morocco, another tier from Uzbekistan down to Pakistan, and then uh, a group of eight countries that is really at the bottom of the global pack in terms of the quality of the lives for their citizens. Okay. This is, this is the uh, ranking. And you see on the right-hand side here of the screen, you see the Social Progress Index score, and you see the GDP per capita. Okay? Now, this score is 70 or 60 or 50 or 40 or, in some cases, 30. 
the way we constructed this index is for every variable, we figured out what is the worst performance ever ever demonstrated on a particular attribute that we've ever seen in the world. And to a first approximation, that's zero. The worst ever. The worst recorded. And 100 is the best result on a particular variable you know, ever achieved uh, you know, with, with a little bit of a buffer you know, to, because uh, you know, we haven't seen anything, you know, anything like this. So 100 is like wonderful society. <laughs> best measured any time in history. And zero is, my God, we're nowhere in society. We're not doing a good job on any of these things. So when you see these scores, think of them in, in, that, in that context. The 0 to 100 scale is not just a statistical artifact. It's, it's an attempt to scale these things based on uh, what reality of, of what can be achieved. Okay. Now, if you look at the top 10, the, the leading country on social progress uh, turns out to be New Zealand. <coughs> turns out to be New Zealand. Uh, we didn't know. Uh, but that's what, it, that's what it turned out to be. And, and number two is uh, Switzerland, uh, and number three is Iceland. The top ten, as you see, uh, turn out to be relatively smaller population countries. And I'm, not sure, I'm sure, 100% sure that's not an accident. Because there's a capacity in countries like that to achieve consensus and to achieve uh, awareness and to achieve... Uh, 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 progress, uh, you know, in in a way that it's hard for Brazil, it's hard for America, it's hard for the very large countries uh, to pull this off. Okay. Uh, notice that New Zealand's GDP per capita is not is the lowest in the top ten. It turns out that GDP per capita rank for uh, New Zealand, I believe, is twenty sixth. So if you take the best available measures of is this a healthy society? and rank, you, you find out that the number one country actually is the 26th country in terms of GDP. So that shows you these things are not the same. These are not the same things. These are different agendas. They're both important. Economic development is crucial. <laughs> but we have to see how it connects to the other crucial things, which is, do we have a better society? Do people improve the quality of their lives? Is, is this a community that, that where, where people uh, are thriving? Uh, these are different. These are different. Now, if we go back to the broader list, um, um, you know, and, and again, these are, these are hard to read, and we hope you'll look at the chart in the executive summary, and you can read that, that better. Um, you know, uh, some interesting uh, just kind of general findings uh, uh, here. The, the, none of the G7 uh, except for Canada is in the top ten. Um, and, and you see, and I'll show you some data later, the U.S. is actually number 16 on this index. And I'll show you the U.S.'s benchmark a, a, a little bit uh, later. Um, we see that, uh, you know, sadly, uh, all the countries in the bottom uh, tier are from Africa. Uh, no surprise there. But some Afri African countries are doing surprisingly well. Ghana, for example, has a very, good, uh, very good scores on, on social progress, as do a variety of other countries. So uh, just this, this, this overall snapshot kind of starts to reveal some interesting, very interesting, very provocative uh, findings. Uh, the BRICs are not so hot on social progress. They're really good on, you know, have been really good on economic development. Brazil actually is the top brick in terms of social progress. Although Brazil has massive issues and they still have protests. Now in China, we haven't seen too many protests yet. But unless we start to deal with this imbalance that, you, that you'll see later, uh, we, we will uh, in China. Okay. Now, what you, the, the overall ranking is interesting and provocative and uh, we hope will get people's attention uh, at the national level, both positively and, and negatively. Uh, some countries, I think, have a lot to be proud of. Other countries have a lot to be concerned about. Um, uh, what, the real power of this, though, remember I said earlier, is the drill down, where you can start to see where 
are we as a society in terms of making headway on this agenda? And uh, you know, we'll start with uh, the U.S. because uh, that's uh, that, that's my country, um, and that's a country that um, has really uh, you know been for a long time a leader in economic development. Uh, you can see GDP per capita rank of of the U.S. is number two. I think number one is Norway, using this data set. Uh, uh, they got a lot of oil, so we we don't feel too badly that we're number two in, in the U.S. Uh, um, social progress rank not so high. Okay, and what this does is it takes all those 54 areas and it starts to say, okay, how are we doing? Um, and Green says that relative to peers, peer countries with roughly similar levels of income, how are we doing on this? Metric, this indicator. Uh, yellow says we're about as where we would expect to be, given this peer group. And red says we're not very good <laughs> relative to the countries that we should be comparing ourselves to on this particular indicator. Now, uh, you know, as American, what's kind of chilling to me is how much red there is up there. You know, this is the you know, second highest GDP per capita in the world. We pride ourselves on having a really good society. We pride ourselves on, uh, you know, uh, how America's, you know, innovated over the years in improving, you know, many things about uh, the quality of society. And there's some green. But compared to other advanced countries that are also wealthy, there's not much green. Uh, where we are conspicuously strong in the U.S. is in advanced education. The serving up the capacity for advanced educational opportunities is, is very strong, but as you see, there's a lot of red, a lot of red. And when we're talking about a strategic agenda for social progress, we have now some of the uh, fundamental infrastructure and rigorous measurement that we now are able to create that agenda from. Although when you have this many red spots, uh, it's hard to be strategic. You you got to hit a lot of areas at one time, uh, and and I suspect that uh, uh, the U.S. Uh, 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 debate about this issue will will rage on. Now here's a very poor country. This is Liberia. Liberia is actually 130 out of 132 in terms of GDP per capita. Very poor country uh, with actually quite good leadership. Uh, and despite the fact that it's a, a quite a poor country, it it didn't fall into the lowest group. You know, it did, it, and it's the social progress index is is a good bit higher. And again, relative to its peers, you see that even a really poor country has some green, particularly here on the opportunity dimension. Here's a very poor country where you'd think. You know, there'd be no opportunity because it's poor. Well, but poor isn't the right way to understand opportunity. You've got to look at opportunity itself. You've got to look at, and what you see in Liberia is 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 a lot, a pretty good record in terms of rights and freedoms and inclusion and 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 even opportunity to get get higher education. Uh, so again, uh, we have these scorecards. We have 132 of these. So for every country, we, you can now drill down, you can look at what you're doing, and then if you're, if you're not doing well on a particular area, you can see the countries like you who are doing well. And you can go look at that and see how they're doing it and what they did over time and their history and, 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 and the environment that allowed them to actually achieve good results or, or that has condemned them to relatively uh, bad results. Now, if we, if, if we look then at the whole uh, body of data, um, of course, we're particularly interested uh, at the connection between economic development and social progress. And I've already started to make it clear that there's not a one-to-one -one connection. There's a correlation, uh, but not a connection. Here is the overall relationship between the two. GDP per capita here horizontally, uh, low to high, uh, social progress index uh, on the vertical, 
uh, low to high, and you see the scores. Um, what you see is that as you move to, uh, as your income improves, as you get a little bit higher income here, down you know, from zero to 5,000, look at what happens to social progress. Okay. Economic development really matters. Okay. You get soaring uh, improvement in, 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 the, in the conditions. But then you see that it starts to get tougher. These are the headwinds I was talking about. It gets harder and harder to really drive things up and up and up, uh, even as, as income levels go higher and higher. And uh, I'll talk a little bit more about why in a minute. So we see this kind of nonlinear relationship. And we, we also see that, that clearly this is sort of not automatic. Because if you look at how sort of bunched things are down here, but how things kind of spread out when you get up into high income. In some countries, they get a very different pass in terms of, of the societal uh, uh, progress that, that occurs. Um, as you look at this, you see that there are countries that do a lot better at social progress than you would think given their income. Uh, some of the stars here, of course, are New Zealand. That's the NZL up, up above that line. That's a country that's way above, it's pulling way above its weight in terms of GDP. Uh, you see Costa Rica, CRI, Uruguay, URY, Estonia, EST. Uh, you see uh, Iceland up there. Uh, CHE is, of course, Switzerland. Um, uh, down here, Philippines, uh, Zambia, Jamaica, Ghana. So, th so there's a set of countries here that have popped out. And, 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 as, as we, and we're understanding more and more about, okay, what are they doing? How have they come together as society? How has the business community worked with the uh, government and NGO community? How has this happened that they're able to do this? In Costa Rica's case, part of it, they, they have a constitution that is all about social progress. It's just literally in the constitution. They're literally required to spend so much money and do these things to achieve certain social uh, uh, objectives. Uh, now, that's, the good news is that there are these countries that pull more than their weight and that provides tremendous hope <laughs> for all of us. Some of these are very poor countries that have kind of figured this out. But look, we have a lot of other countries that despite the fact that they're doing pretty well on GDP per capita uh, are not pulling their weight. And uh, those, some of those countries are probably not at all surprising to, to many of you. Uh, uh, this is Angola. This is Iran, Russia, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, uh, UAE, Israel. Uh, there's a variety of them that are substantially not delivering social progress that one would expect they could given uh, their, their level of income if we look at the, the group of countries as a whole. We've never seen this picture before in all of history. We've never known this. We've never been able to relate these things. Because all the measurement has either been very incomplete or it's commingled the economic. You can't tell this from the Human Development Report. Because the Human Development Report has GDP in it and social factors in it. Okay? Now we can start to pull apart development you know, into these fundamental components. Now, what we're finding is when we start to pull this apart and we start to pull social progress apart, we see some very different things going on. What we see on basic human needs is that there's sort of a, that's, that's the blue line, there's kind of a rocket ship with development, with economic development. You get a little income and boy, shoosh, off you go on basic human needs. And that's been a, a triumph. The Millennium Development Goals have amplified and, 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 and supported that, that, that process. Uh, and we see that this is quite a tight relationship in terms of, you know, company, uh, everybody kind of follows the, the same path. When we see these building blocks and foundations of well-being, we see the same thing happen initially, but again, we start to see uh, the headwinds 
it gets harder to really achieve more and more progress on this. And then when we look at opportunity, that's the most challenging of all. That's the thing where income is no guarantee <laughs> that a society is going to have real opportunity uh, uh, for, for its citizens. Uh, here's the basic human needs relationship. You can see this is a pretty tight relationship. Uh, this is a measure of how much we're explaining. How much does GDP explain in terms of basic human needs? And you know that's a big number. Okay, uh, but when we start to look at uh, uh, foundations of well-being, it starts to explain less. And when we get to opportunity, I don't have the number on that, but it explains even less. Okay. It's clear that, that improving well-being and creating opportunity are different policy agendas. They don't happen anywhere near automatically, uh, just as you get uh, a higher income. On the opportunity dimension, a lot of the underperformers in terms of social progress uh, are underperformers because they underperform on opportunity. That's a, a, a big headline. You know, fr- from this work. And, you know, why was there an Arab Spring? <laughs> because there was not enough opportunity in those societies for people to feel. Uh, you know, people, people can deal with, you know, not perfect housing and not perfect this and not perfect that as long as there's a sense of opportunity. As long as they feel like they or their children can move ahead. But when you start... Uh, having this understand this, this sense that there isn't actually that much opportunity or as much opportunity as we would like, that's when societies start to, to, to fall apart. And I think we have a lot of societies around the world these days uh, that are uh, vulnerable. Uh, uh, and uh, when, we, when you have the lack of sense of opportunity uh, and, and, and that's created, that, that feeling is sometimes created by uh, the, the, rea- the kind of manifestation of that is often income differences and people don't feel like they can get a job and so forth. Uh, uh, they don't have the rights to, to better themselves, then, then, then bad things happen. And by being able to pull this apart and look at it and look at what's going on here, uh, country by country, and who's doing well and who's doing poorly, I think we have, again, some critical infrastructure which allows us to make social change uh, in the world. And that's very much the goal of this effort. Now, this is first and foremost about measurement. Um, and, uh, and, and you've seen some of the preliminary findings. There's a lot more than I haven't been able to talk about. But as I said earlier, at the core, we're not just here to do a measurement exercise. Uh, we're here to actually create change on the ground. We, we want this data, we want this work to inform and enable and create pressure and create insight to allow countries and societies to actually move ahead. We've never had this infrastructure before. The, in terms of the question that then happens is how do you get action to happen? What do you do? We put out this index. What do we do then? Um, and our goal from the beginning has been to create uh, a process and a network and an organization and a set of partners that will reach every corner of the world. Um, and uh, you know, Deloitte is helping us with their enormous reach, and, and other of our partners are helping. Coca-Cola is helping us as well. Uh, This is actually a meeting that you'll hear about a little bit later uh, this morning. Uh, This is uh, uh, me, uh, I'm embarrassed to say, uh, a meeting with the president of Paraguay. And what you're going to hear is is social progress uh, index and these measures are the official uh, measures that Paraguay uses to measure how well it's doing. So our goal is very audacious. We want, you know, everybody measures GDP. We want everybody to measure this. And, to, and for this to come out every quarter, well, it won't come out every quarter, but every year, to kind of take the temperature of how, how's the society doing, and then, and then to translate those scorecards into a policy agenda. And to enable businesses, business leaders, to figure out where the business needs to put its weight and where business needs to get involved. I think increasingly we're understanding that the role of business has to change in society. We can't just step back and say, social progress is not our job. 
That's what business has done for so many years. I mean, lots of businesses have cared a lot and done a lot of things. But, but in general, the idea is business is about business and social progress is for others. And increasingly, that's breaking down. And we have companies like Coca-Cola and others here that are trying to engage in their society. But the question is, where do you engage? How do you engage? Um, and, and, and we very much hope that this effort starts to say, okay, how do I think about that? Where, what are the priorities? How can I connect this to my business? What we're finding, actually, is uh, over and over again, we're finding that the greatest opportunities for business and the greatest constraints and costs for business have to do with social issues. They have to do with inadequate skills or... Uh, you know, problems of safety or inability, uh, inability to use resources effectively in their society. So, so this uh, whole effort is not just about government. It's, it's also fundamentally about how to get the business community focused on uh, how it can engage and how it can move things forward. So hopefully um, our vision is a vision where social progress and economic development together, are the way we define success. And those are equal, and, uh, and they reinforce each other uh, in some cases, and they work against each other in others. Um, I have personally been involved in uh, economic development, economic measurement now for decades. I, I was for many years the co-chair of the Global Competitiveness Report that came out every year that kind of benchmarked countries on competitiveness. What I saw with my own eyes was when that report came out, because it was granular, because it had a framework, because it got better and better over time, uh, every government looked at it. And uh, there, uh, and I, uh, committees were formed to pick it apart, to figure out what was holding that country's ranking back. Uh, so if it was, the, it was taking too long to clear goods through the port, then they'd work on the port. And if it was taking too long to start a new business, they would work on that law. And if there was crummy infrastructure, then they would work on the highway system. That's what we can accomplish here. By having a transparent measurement framework that's out there for everyone to see uh, year after year, and by having a group of partners that will help drive this to the right people. At the, at, the, at the action and the country level, we believe that we can really step up and accelerate the pace of, of social change. Uh, so that is our effort. That is our vision. And uh, I'm very, very excited to now turn it over to Michael and have a panel uh, to really talk about both the idea but also how we put this into practice. But, but, but I, we invite your participation Everybody in this room knows somebody that they can introduce to this. Everybody in this room has access to political leaders who work on this stuff. Uh, uh, we invite your participation. Uh, uh, we've, got, we've, got a, we've got a start here. We're very excited. Uh, but the proof will be the change that actually occurs over, over the coming years and the coming decades. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Mike. I always like to say that uh, Mike is a sort of living refutation of Karl Marx is saying that philosophers have only interpreted the world, our job is to change it. Mike has interpreted the world and changed it in so many ways. Fantastic. Let me say, so this is very much the start of a conversation. There's a conversation going on online now on hashtag social progress. Our website, all the data, all the methodologies on our website. This is not a black box. Transparency and openness about that data is crucial for us. Download our data, use it, analyze it. You know, we really want your feedback, as Mike said. So this is really, we've, from the beta version from last year, it's improved so much because of people using it and feeding back to us. We really want your engagement. Let me turn now to the panel. And uh, there was one question on Twitter that I won't ask you, which was Mike said that uh, small countries tend to do better on social progress, so will an independent Scotland do better on social progress in the UK? <laughs> <coughs> But maybe, Steve, uh, Steve Armour from Deloitte, you know, let's just get serious about this. Why does this matter to business? 
Uh, you're a business. A business is there to make profit. Why does true growth, social and economic progress, matter to a business? Well, I think uh, um, it's widely recognised now that business does have a fund- fundamental role to play in building society. And definitely in the aftermath of the uh, global financial crisis, I think we're seeing a real shift in, mar- in business attitude, a growing number of big company CEOs uh, in an effort to rebuild trust in their business after the crisis are seeking to articulate a, a broader purpose for their business and communicate with all of their stakeholders rather than just the, uh, the shareholders, the capital markets, to demonstrate that their enterprise can be a force for good in, um, in contributing to society. And that purpose is distinct from but not inconsistent with, the, with their profit motive. Uh, and once, once a CEO or a boardroom recognises that as, as a strategic objective or a strategic imperative, then they need to decide where to put their efforts and where they should aim to get a return on their investment in, whether it's just their corporate and social responsibility effort, effort or a broader attempt to give expression, if you like, to their brand uh, and convey their brand positioning to not just, as I say, to their shareholders, but to their own talent, uh, to their customers, their consumers, their regulators, the media, um, other observers of their business. And I think the, you know, we've talked a lot about the index as an index. We see it from a business perspective very much more as a tool going forward to give a bit of a signpost, a roadmap to the business community in collaboration as David Sproul and Michael Porter talked about that necessary collaboration with government and civil society to make sure they get the biggest impact, both in terms of impact on the societal need they're trying to address, that is the most closely aligned with their brand values, with their core competencies, and also has the biggest impact, therefore, on on them as as a business. Thanks, Steve. You talk about using the social progress index framework as a tool. B, Coca-Cola is already using the framework as a tool. Tell us a little about that and why the social progress framework matters to Coca-Cola. Sure, and and I think I'll just, you know, align with what Professor Porter said earlier, which is, and I'll say it in my words, this is a team sport. We know that one company, one NGO, one government can try to do it alone, but it's better when done in partnership. And what the Social Progress Index does is it gives not just a framework, but a common language, common definitions, and a way to have a conversation where you know that you're talking about the same outcomes that you're trying to drive. You're measuring in a consistent manner, and you're able to then make progress against the things that truly matter to that local community. So let me just give an example of the work we've been doing in Brazil. In 2009, we started a program called Colectivo, and today... We have over 550 of those initiatives around Brazil, 70,000 people. But the question becomes, how can we make it better? It started in providing technical and life skills for youth to help move them into opportunities of employment. And as we got into the program and as we start to look at the Social Progress Index, we realized that we could spend a little bit more time moving from a program-centric approach to a people-centric approach. And as we think about the partnerships, bringing in civil society from the beginning and ensuring that we're truly listening to what those needs are and addressing the needs and then measuring the outcomes and consistently improving. And also um, taking a look at the uniqueness of that chart up there where how does the economic development and social development work hand in hand? Because at the end of the day, we are still a business and we do want to make a return. We also know that in making that return for our business, we can invest that much more into the community as we grow and ensure that the um, goals are aligned. Thanks, Steve. Um, Sally, I mean, the Skoll Foundation works on social entrepreneurship. How does social entrepreneurship fit into this story? And maybe I can sort of tag on a sort of supplementary question, which the word that's come up is this sort of collaboration. I want to come back to the other panel members on this. Also, well, how does collaboration fit into the story? How do you get the sectors working together? Thanks, Michael. Um, Social entrepreneurs have been working on the challenge of the social progress imperative for a very long time. And in fact, they are master catalysts of the kinds of collaboration we've been discussing. They understand that none of us can do this alone. And although their ideas, their innovations are catalytic, they pursue common cause with the business sector and with the public sector. 
Let me give you an example. We have some social entrepreneurs here in the audience, in fact, and as you know, we'll be engaging with them throughout the week at the, at the Skull World Forum. Uh, one of the organizations we've had the privilege of supporting over many years is, is CampFed, the Campaign for Female Education in Africa. They have been working with the governments of Ghana, the government of Zambia, both of which are making headway on their social progress in the areas that CampFed has been pursuing. They do so in partnership with the ministry, in partnerships with the communities, with the stakeholders, as you said, Steve, embracing those stakeholders, the grassroots, the people whose best interests are aligned with the advances of social progress. They are the real champions of social progress. Social entrepreneurs unleash that, that potential, and they do so by harnessing the full, full potential of the entire society. That's headway. And we're seeing it with social entrepreneurs and the work they do. Fantastic. Thanks, Sally. I uh, want to just emphasize, uh, Mike said the scorecards earlier, and that identifies you know, priorities for action, but also where there are great successes. And one of the things we highlight in our report, which is available online, is where our strengths and weakness analysis scorecards highlights where countries are doing particular we particularly well and where there may be really powerful social innovation models that can be copied, including CAMFED. And we have a nice case study of CAMFED in the report. Mike, can I take to you on this point, this thing about this collaboration point? You, you know, you've talked a lot about the business. How do we bring the different actors in society together to really solve problems? You didn't tell me you were going to ask me that question. <laughs> um, well, Michael, I, I think, uh, first of all, uh, we, we start by bringing people together by actually understanding that we're kind of all in this together. Um, and... Uh, uh, I think that, you know, there, there's a lot of government officials historically that don't understand that if we don't have a healthy business and a healthy economy and healthy companies, we're not going to make much progress in society at all that, because that's where the resources come from. That's where the wealth comes from. Uh, and, uh, and there's a lot of businesses that thought, you know, I have nothing to do with, uh, with government and all this social stuff. That's not my job. Just leave me alone. I gotta, I'll get to make a profit. I'll pay my taxes, and then you guys do something with the money, you know. So there's a lot of attitudes that you know, where, where we've kind of seen the various actors have seen their, themselves as separate and in some cases suspicious or, or even outright hostile you know, to the other sector. So how many businesses have you know, fought with governments over whether they should have reasonable regulation? <laughs> You know, uh, uh, we, we've had we've had the so so part of it is breaking down the sense that uh, a, a business do, that these things don't matter for business, breaking down the thing that government the business doesn't matter for government, and and I, and I think that's starting to happen. Uh, but but ultimately, uh, as as B said, I think very eloquently, um, you know, we haven't had a way to discuss these issues. We haven't had a common language. We haven't had a framework for how to, how to think about how economic development connects to social progress. And we, we're now, you know, you hear this word inclusive growth or inclusive development. We, we've got some buzzwords like that, but they don't really mean anything yet. And uh, what we're trying to do is, is build out the kind of infrastructure and the intellectual infrastructure and the, and the measurement infrastructure that can allow us to have these conversations, set priorities, uh, and, and collaborate. And, uh, and I think uh, on the business side, as, as those of you that have read some of my work on shared value know, uh, I actually believe that the greatest growth opportunities and profit opportunities for business are actually in addressing a lot of these societal needs. Uh, those are the biggest market opportunities uh, in, in the world. And I think we have wonderful examples, including Coca-Cola, of where that's happening as we speak. The, there's no conflict between business success and social progress. Not any inherent conflict. Uh, there's a lot of conflict you know, in the world, uh, but, but it's not inherent. And, and I think it's, it, we, we, but, but as, as we reveal and as we put more light on this and, 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 and illustrate this, I think, I think the process is, is now underway, as, as was said earlier, uh, by, by, by Steve, I think I mean, businesses are starting to think very differently uh, about this set of issues, but again, they, they're, they're feeling their way. So I think we have here a powerful opportunity to accelerate this collaboration. I'm, I'm delighted we have to, with us today the uh, Minister of Planning of Paraguay, Jose Molinas. 
Can we get a microphone to Mr. Linares? I'd love to get his perspective from that Paraguayan government story. But first, can I just ask you, Steve? Deloitte's been talking a lot in the last year about the solution revolution. What's this and how are we going to solve problems? What's the story there? So the solution revolution is a a piece of work that we did um, and published last summer, I think. Uh, And it actually really builds on, examines uh, examples of that collaboration that we've been talking about and seeks to set out a blueprint for how when you bring together the authority and policy-making power of government with the convening power and the deep issue expertise of NGOs, of civil society, together with the, just the depth of resources, technical resources, financial resources and human resources of business, then you really can deliver creative, innovative, robust solutions to some of these significant societal challenges uh, in, in a very short time frame with, with very strong results. Can I, ju- I, I just wanted to pick up on what Michael was saying. I was listening to Michael's o- opening presentation, and it just um, sort of revealed to me perhaps the sophistication and some of the nuance of this index. Because uh, I was reflecting on the example of Saudi Arabia, which, as we saw, scored was one of the worst performers relative to its GDP per capita. And... And I was in Riyadh uh, not so long ago. Um, I'm on something called the Saudi-British Business Council. And uh, actually, in Saudi Arabia, they have free access to health care and education, high quality, because they can afford it. So I imagine, Michael, they would have scored very well under the Human Development Index, which is about education, health, and GDP. And yet, I imagine, on the opportunities category of the index, they score terribly. And we know there are lots of issues about personal rights and freedoms, but what the Saudi government are most concerned with is that capacity for individuals to optimise their personal potential, which was the definition of the opportunities thing. They are most concerned about youth unemployment. They have policies to have to cause businesses to have a certain number of Saudi nationals employed. And because of those concerns, we're now collaborating with the, the government and the business community in the kingdom and in the United Kingdom on trying to promote entrepreneurism, trying to uh, cause the Saudis think their small, medium-sized businesses are underperforming both in terms of job creation and exports and working together to try and solve that as a way of responding to that issue under their opportunities channel and solving youth unemployment, which of course is one of the perhaps underlying reasons for the Arab Spring. Mr. Melinas, do you tell us a little bit about Paraguay has formally adopted the Social Progress Index as a measure of national performance. Tell us a little about your experience. Right. Thank you very much, Michael, for the opportunity to comment. And thank you, thank you very much, Professor Porter, for, and the Social Imperative uh, Steering Committee for putting together this tool, this tool that is of great value for a country like, like Paraguay. I'm sure you have seen the ranking Paraguay was number 72, is in the, in the fourth tier. But it's also a small country, a small country, and we are hoping, following Professor Porter uh, hint, that a small country can progress uh, faster. Uh, Paraguay ranks in the 55th percentile. And one of the great advantages that, the, the, that our country benefits from, from this initiative is to have a tool to start a dialogue with society of putting people first. As uh, Mrs. Bia said, this tool emphasizes reaching the full potential of every, of every citizen. And that's something that everybody likes. And because everybody likes, it's also a tool to create social consensus, as Mrs. Sally said. And some early signs in Paraguay of creating the social consensus are mainly two. One is that last year, even with the Vida, Vida approach, the country like that and create a, <clears throat> a decree at that moment that said we are going to take as a country this as a key a <coughs> measure of our progress, of our social progress. And immediately a steering committee was created with the government, business, and other civil society organizations, 14 civil society organizations. And that steering committee is emphasizing 
three key elements for the, for the country. Nutrition, water, and affordable housing. So that is one first contribution of the social index to put in the, agenda, the social agenda uh, in a very high level in, in Paraguay. The second is that the National Development Plan is using this framework and is taking the index as a key monitoring tool. And as you, know, uh, you may know, in many countries, the National Development Plan is mandatory for all public sector. So it's a way to ensure that this framework and the good thing that it is pursued, allowing Paraguayans to reach their full potential, uh, will have a privileged place in the, in the overall agenda. And some thoughts of what, what next. We believe, as a government, we cannot just focus on three or four. We have the responsibility to work on all this agenda. This is the government terms of reference. And we would like to be accountable for the advance of each of, uh, of, each of these 54 indicators in the country. We would love to be able to report progress on a yearly basis on all the 54. We don't have the data yet. We are in the process of generating that data. The, way, the same way that we report economic growth every year, and last year we have an exceptional record economic growth, but we don't have the data to, to report social progress yet. And even if we have the data for, for the 54 indicators internationally, what you are going to see next year in this, in this rank is al with data that already took place. Because data from one country takes a lot of time to get harmonized in international organizations. And probably in the 2015 meeting, you will see what happened in 2013. But we would like to, to report progress on a yearly basis. Uh, the same way that we report progress in 2015, we are going to report GDP growth that happened this year. We would like to be able, able sometime to report social progress of what happened in the immediate past year. And that will create a lot of incentive to government and to society. Because government wants to be ac accountable for what they did. We have a change in, in administration. So if the data is from 2012, that will be due to the previous administration. But we would like to have that, that incentive to report on a yearly basis. And that is what motivates us to start working with all the key stakeholders in developing the data and, uh, and to adapt to the national circumstances. For, ex for example, we don't have data, the data that Gallup uh, collect, but we need to, to, uh, to create data similarly for our, our country on a, yearly, uh, on a yearly basis. And thank you again. Thank you again for, for putting together this beautiful framework, this beautiful uh, index that allows us to focus on people and to work together for the, all people to reach the full potential. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you. I'm conscious that we're very, very short of time, so I don't, I'm afraid I don't think I'm going to have time to go to the audience for questions. But let me flag, first of all, on the front row, you will find a selection of the board members and members of Social Progress Imperative. So come and ask some of our colleagues, Roberto Ottavio, Vrinci Biondi Mori, uh, Alvaro Rodriguez Aragui. Come and talk to our colleagues. Jonathan Talbot in the second row. There's lots of people here. Come and talk to us. Uh, engage with us online. Um, but let me, just before we finish, I want to come back to the panel. There's two questions that have come up online that we may want to pick up on. First one is, I think, Steve, you touched on this. How's the Middle East doing? What's the message for the Middle East? A second question is, what about inequality? Uh, so, and the question I want to throw to you is, for each of your organizations, what's next? Uh, Steve, you go first. Let's come down this way, and Mike, maybe we can finish with you on those couple of conceptual points. Uh, well, finishing quickly, I think the inequality bit... You know, I think that comparison of GDP and social progress perhaps 
gives a real indicator as to those economies where uh, high GDP per capita is not converting into social progress for all, maybe converting to social progress for the few. Just be my observation on that. Uh, what's, what's next for us? Uh, we're just really excited about uh, the, as, as I said earlier, the index as a tool. You know, I think we have to recognise this is the first year, so we shouldn't get overexcited, but you know, the Paraguay example I think is a really good one of that collaboration coming together. What we should see is that if, if that collaboration Paraguay sticks to their guns, those indicators that are red at the moment for Paraguay, water, nutrition, uh, sanitation, should over the next, as they execute their five-year plans, should, should turn off. Those red lights get turned off by looking at other countries where the, those lights are green. And, and we just look forward to being part of that collaboration in Paraguay, but similar collaborations elsewhere. Great. Thanks. Uh, Sally. Well, in thinking about the question about income inequality, I have been struck by the finding in the research done for the social progress imperative and the index in particular that correlates happiness with opportunity over income. Now, I am not saying that income isn't critical. It is. But pursuit of opportunity, the, the, the realization that citizens have a path forward is, I think, a critical, critical finding here and really shines the light on that category. Now, nutrition, basic needs, meeting those basic needs in health, the building blocks, all essential. Arab Spring, all about opportunity, all about opportunities for those, what Tom Friedman calls those young men lying around. It's absolutely essential that people feel that they can pursue happiness for themselves. What's next for the, uh, the, the Skoll Foundation? I think I'm looking at the social progress imperative and this index as really the wind in the sails. For too long, social entrepreneurs have been working against headwinds. This really starts to incentivize the kinds of collaborations that we know are essential to the large-scale change that social entrepreneurs are all about. So I see tremendous opportunity for convergence, for alignment, for action, and for the results that will actually add up for citizens across the world. Thank you, Sally. And uh, the Skoll World Forum, of course, this launch is part of the Skoll World Forum, which moves to Oxford tomorrow, running for three days. And we're really honoured that the Skoll Foundation has kindly given us a really great location to meet with those social entrepreneurs, the thousand change makers, who are really, got, we hope, are going to be partners for social progress imperative in the future. So, Sally, thanks to you. B. I'll, since they did a wonderful job around inequality in the Middle East on those questions, I'll talk about what's next and say it's about a call to action for business, for society, for government, for NGO partners. Move forward, test this out, take it into action, use it. It's a great tool. It also, for us, we found is a capability that has to be built. Recently in Brazil, we did a session on shared value. So we were able to bring in the learnings from Professor Porter and have the government sit at the table, civil society, different people from the Amazon state, as well as other corporations and NGO partners to hear how we're deploying shared value and also starting to use a social progress index. What I'd also say is what's next for all of us is to go to the community level. So right now we're at the country level. We have to keep doing more work to get this to, to the community level because, as Professor Porter said, the true power in this framework is the details, and the details matter because we're not just talking about data and charts up there. We're talking about real people, real people who have an opportunity to benefit, which means that the entire world benefits. And so since we're all in this together, I think we have to go to that next level. So that's the call to action. Fantastic. Thank, Thank you, you. B. Um, mm -hmm. We talked about getting the granular action. I just want to recognize our colleagues from Orchestra, the uh, think tank from the Basque Country, who have done a first pilot of deploying the Social Progress Index at a subnational level. It's in our report. Read the case study. It's really, really fascinating. Uh, and just a quick shout out to Patrick O'Sullivan, who's written a fantastic chapter in our methodological report, all about the conceptual foundations of social progress. So, for you philosophers in the audience, I know there are some there. Uh, please do talk to Patrick. Mike, final thoughts. Where do you, I mean, look, as I said before, you've driven change in so many ways in business, in economic development. Where's next for driving change in social progress? Well, I think, uh, you know, to me, the most powerful force for driving change is, number one, it, ideas. Uh, it, it's really having a way to look at the problem, 
see the problem differently. Uh, and I think I think the beginnings here of, of how we can understand development in a more holistic way is, is going to be an enormous uh, unleashing of progress. And then the second kind of key driver is information and measurement. Uh, uh, actually starting to get rigorous, concrete uh, scorecards about how we're doing and whether we're making progress or not and how we're comparing to others, I think, I think are critical. Uh, the, this, this effort, we're in this for the long run. Uh, we are going to keep uh, pounding away at this. It's going to get better and better. Uh, we're going to, with your help, uh, get... Uh, there's gonna, hopefully next year there'll be five Paraguays or ten Paraguays or 20 Paraguays. Uh, where we've collectively uh, uh, engaged at this level to, uh, and 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 you know, think of the exhilaration of actually uh, what what the minister said. I mean, this is about people and opportunity. What a great conversation to have uh, in terms of policy and society and development. And this is the conversation we 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 must have. And this is the conversation I think we now are in the position to have. And. As we have more Coca-Colas and Skoll Foundation and Cisco's and Deloitte's, you know, having that conversation with us, I, I, I think, I, I think uh, I, my, my level of optimism that we, we now can start to see a way forward is, is, is higher than it's been in, in, in ever. So uh, we need your help, though. We need your participation. We need everybody here to give, help us open the door, help us get this, get this to the right person, uh, work with us in this country, uh, we, this is this is a, a, a global, uh, hopefully a movement that uh, will take off. Great, thank you. Um, I'm really sorry, I've overrun. Um, thank you to the panel. Thank you to our host, Deloitte. Thank you, Dean, for coming. David, back to you to close up for us. Thank you. Great. Thank Michael, thank you. I will be brief, and, and let me just add my thanks, obviously, to Michael Porter, Michael Green, our panelist, B, Sally, Steve, for a really engaging. Uh, morning discussion. I think the case is made in terms of the importance of this. It's clear we now have an index, something that's actionable. And if one thinks of next steps, I think Sally made the point very well, social entrepreneurs have been at this for some time. You know, big business is there. B said it, Steve said it. And of course, we heard from the minister from Paraguay in terms of government engaging. So what next? This is our chance to get others to jump on board. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Well done. Very good. Oh, that was perfect. That was perfect. It was really good.